for the benefit of those who are watching the recording, I'm Scott Williams, he, him. I'm the executive director of Spectrum, Waterloo Region's Rainbow Community Space, and thank you for watching. Um, I did want to uh, acknowledge the truth that we are situated on the Haldeman Tract, which is the traditional territory of the Mississauga Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Neutral Peoples. And we at Spectrum have been looking at um, the actions that we can take and looking at the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I wanted to just mention today, um, numbers 13 through 17 focus on language and culture and the importance of language and culture preserving it. Um, and so one of the things that we are looking at doing uh, for our board is to provide some education on uh, language and culture. And then we're also looking at perhaps offering monthly uh, language courses in Ojibwe or Ojibwe Moan. So um, please watch for that coming in the future. Mm -hmm. And then I will pass things over to Angie. Thank you so much, Scott, for the introduction and for offering a land acknowledgement, as well as for inviting us to join you this evening. Um, good evening again. My name is Angie Pham, and I'm the Community Development Worker at Waterloo Region Community Legal Services. I'll also be monitoring the chat box if you'd like to ask any questions throughout the presentation. Um, please allow me to introduce my colleague as well as the presenter of today's session, Shannon Down. Shannon is the Executive Director and a lawyer at Waterloo Region Community Legal Services. She practiced employment law and mental health law in private practice for a number of years before joining the legal clinic in 2013. She continues to have an interest in the area of consent and capacity law and mental health law, as well as a strong focus on social justice. Before I turn it over to her, I'd like to give you a bit of information about our legal clinic. Waterloo Region, I'm sorry, Waterloo Region Community Legal Services is a nonprofit organization funded by Legal Aid Ontario we provide legal services and supports to residents living with low income across the Waterloo region free of charge. Our mission is to ensure that everyone in our community has equal access to justice and the legal supports necessary to maintain their well being and improve their quality of life. These services include assistance with housing, such as tenants' rights and responsibilities, assistance with ODSP, Ontario Works, and CPP disability, employment law and employment insurance, immigration law consumer protection, notarization and commissioning of documents. We also have an Indigenous justice program which supports status and non-status Indigenous folks. We have a sexual harassment in the workplace project and we also offer uh, services and support in name change and gender marker changes. Uh, if there's a legal area that we cannot support in, we can uh, answer questions and give referrals or information to guide you in the right direction. For example, we don't practice in family law or criminal law, but we can give you resources. Our services are available in English, French, and Spanish, but we can also arrange for an interpreter in any other language as needed. Uh, we will also provide our contact information later on in the session if you'd like to reach us at any time. Uh, thank you for your patience, and I will now turn things over to Shannon. Thanks, Angie, and thanks, Scott, for the um the land acknowledgement and I would just like to add to that that as a settler on on these indigenous lands that we are on today um, I am committed to um, educating myself about um, the harms that colonialism and that um, that as a settler that we've caused to our indigenous friends and uh, that's as part of that um, again also Scott mentioned um, uh, participating in the, the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Report. So just a couple of housekeeping items before I get into the uh, presentation. Um, I'll ask everyone during the presentation just to meet yourself because we're recording this for um, other um, people that they, to um, watch afterwards. If you have questions, please feel free to jot them down. We'll have time at the end. Um, when it comes time to do the questions, we're gonna turn off the recording so that if there's um, anything that's of a private nature, although we're in a group, it won't be part of the recording that will be put on our, our YouTube channel or be available for other people to watch. So I'm gonna set up my screen share and go through some um, slides with you.
So welcome to this presentation on wills and power of attorney. The information that we're going to be um, talking about tonight is legal information. It's not legal advice. Every case is different and I encourage people to consult with a lawyer paralegal about your specific issue. And we've already done the land acknowledgement. So are you seeing, is there that message, Angie, coming up on yours? Um, yes. Any suggestions for how I get that off of there? Yes, um, try on your keyboard, control, alt, and delete. And then uh, start your task manager. Yep. And you'll want to select a uh, link or Skype that we use and end that task. Okay. That should help. Thank you. You're welcome. So our agenda tonight is to talk about wills, power of attorney for personal care, and the continuing power of attorney for property, as well as some information about what happens if you don't have these documents, if you don't have a will, or if you don't have a power of attorney. What is a will? A person's will is a written document. It sets out your instructions for what you would like to happen to your property after you die. One of the main functions is to name a person um, known as an executor or an estate trustee who you want to carry out the terms of your will. The estate trustee is responsible for paying all your debts and ensuring that your property goes where your will says it should go. And it's important to know that a will only takes effect after your death. So you prepare your will obviously while you're alive, but it doesn't, it doesn't kick into effect until your death. Anyone who's over the age of 18 can make a will. When you make a will, the law says that you have to be of sound mind. Sound mind means essentially that you don't have a mental impairment that stops you from know it, knowing what you're doing. And for a will, what you need to know to be capable of, of to be of sound mind or to be capable is to know what property it is that you're going to be passing through your will to your beneficiaries and to know who might expect to benefit from your will. So who are the, who are the members of your family, your friends who might expect to, to benefit. So as long as you know what property and the nature of the document, so what a will does. So it's a fairly basic test for capacity in order to be able to make a will. If you die without a will, it's called dying intestate. And your property will be divided according to the Succession Law Reform Act, which might be different from how you would, you would like to divide up your property. One of the other difficulties is because there's no estate trustee to administer your estate, which is one of the things that you would do through your will, an application has to be made to court to appoint someone to act as your estate trustee. That application uh, takes time, it takes money. Depending on the size of your estate, it um, can be quite complex and expensive. There is now a new simplified process for small estates um, in Ontario. Um, but if your estate is over, I believe the threshold is $150,000. So if the total value of your estate is beyond that value, then it's not, you can't use the simplified procedure and you'd most likely need to hire a lawyer to help you with that. So having a will solves all those problems. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about what happens to your state if you die without a will. According to, the, we have a law in Ontario called the Succession Law Reform Act. And according to that act, unless you have someone who's financially dependent on you when you die, and that person makes a claim, the first 350,000 uh, dollars in your estate is given to your spouse if you have one. Uh, that could be a common law spouse, or sorry, that is a, a, a legally married spouse, not a common law spouse. So that the use of spouse in that in that case only refers to someone you're legally married to. Your spouse also has the option to claim half of your net family property through a, through an election process. So they can either take the first $350,000 or they can elect to take half of the net family property. Anything beyond that 
$350,000, that first $350,000 is shared between your spouse and your descendants, for example, your children or your grandchildren, according to some specific rules in that act. If you have no spouse, uh, your children inherit the estate. If any of them have died, that children's descendants uh, will inherit their share. If you have no spouse or children or grandchildren, your parents would inherit your estate equally. If there are no, if you just have one surviving parent, they would inherit all of it. If there are no surviving parents, it would go to your brothers and sisters. And if any of them have predeceased you, their children would inherit their share. If you have no parents, no spouse, no children, no brothers and sisters, your nieces and nephews would inherit the estate equally. Um, and however, if one of them had predeceased you, their share does not pass to their children. When only more distant relatives survive, so you have no nieces or nephews, um, none of the, the more the closer family relations, um, then the rules get a little more complex and you need to speak to a lawyer. So I'm not going to get into the details of that tonight, but just suffice it to say that there are a set of rules that continue to apply if if you don't have any of the the previously mentioned people um, still alive at the time of your death. So these are some of the essential components in a will. There's a clause to name the estate trustee. You want to indicate who are your beneficiaries and what um, what assets go to those beneficiaries in your will. You would like to name a guardian for any children, any minors under the age of 18, and decide what are your wishes for any specific gifts and what's called the residue. And I'll explain what that means. So specific gifts would be something, um, a particular asset that you want to give to a particular person. For example, I want to give my grandmother's wedding ring that belongs to me now to my oldest daughter, Allison. That would be an example of a specific gift. After you give away any specific gifts and after your debts are paid, everything that's left over that you own at the time of your death, we it's called the, the residue. That's the legal term. So it could be a mixture of money in your bank account, investments, um, RSPs. Um, it could be your car, a house any property that essentially that you own at the time of your death, except for things that don't pass through your will. So there are some assets if you name a uh, designated beneficiary that pass through that designation that would not be considered part of the residue because technically they're not flowing through your will. I'm gonna talk about some ways to make a will. One way is to use what's called Clio's Wills Guided Pathways. It's um, on <clears throat> through a website, stepstojustice.ca, and I've put the link um, on the screen. This is a set of questions that you go through. You answer the questions and provide information about your assets and your beneficiaries. And when you finish the process, uh, the program um, develops a will for you a very basic simple will. So that's one option. You can also do what's called a holograph will, which would contain your name, a statement to the effect of this is my last will and testament, um, designation of an estate trustee, and a description of what your wishes are. And that all has to be in your own handwriting to be a valid holograph will. That also has to be signed and dated, but it does not have to be witnessed. You can buy a will kit. There are companies that sell kits for an Ontario will. It has to, I recommend that you get one that's specific for Ontario. There are companies that um, provide services online or you can uh, buy them through stationery, um, through a store at Staples places like that. It has to be dated. It's important with a, um, a will kit that it has to be properly signed. So it has to be signed in front of two witnesses who 
also must sign in your presence and each other's presence. So everybody has to be there to witness each other's signature. And there's an affidavit of execution, which has to be sworn by one of the witnesses, essentially saying, I was there, I witnessed the person uh, whose will it is, I witnessed them sign the will, and I uh, witnessed the other person, the other um, uh, witness sign the will as well. So that's it's an additional document in, um, in addition to the will. You can also hire a lawyer to draft your will. That's very common. This costs more than the other options, but the lawyer will ensure that your will follows all of the rules required by law for a valid will. I've provided a resource for the Waterloo Law Association. And on that website, there is a list of lawyers who practice in the area of wills and trusts. And you can search um, in a search function and find the, the name of a lawyer to go and see about a will. The price varies. I can't really quote a specific price because I don't practice in this area anymore in private practice. But when I was practicing, I believe the going rates were approximately $250 to $500 for a single will. Um, sometimes there was a small discount for what was called uh, a mirror will where you have spouses who are essentially doing almost the same will but mirrored to each other so wife or husband or spouse um, basically gives everything to their other spouse um, and they name them as executor so it the the wills are almost identical they're they're a mirror version of each other So what happens if you own property outside of Ontario? A will created in Ontario um, may or may not be valid for property outside of Ontario. It depends on whether it's compliant with the laws of the jurisdiction um, in which the foreign asset is located. So there is a, a will called an international will and the province of Ontario is party to a convention um, which is called the convention providing a uniform law on the form of an international will very long title. It's also known as the Washington Convention. Under our Succession Law Reform Act, if a will is made in accordance with the rules pres prescribed by that convention, and both of the relevant jurisdictions are contracting parties to that convention, the will is re valid regardless of where it was made and the location of the assets or the residence of the testator or the person making the will. We'd just like to say, if, you, if this applies to you, if you do own um, assets in a foreign jurisdiction, for example, a, a vacation home in another country, that's a situation where I would strongly recommend going to see a lawyer to help you draft your will. I would not go through one of the self-help um, will options, either a will kit or doing the guided pathways, because you wanna make sure that your will applies to that property in that foreign jurisdiction. And you may need some specific advice about that. So I'm going to turn now to talking about power of attorney documents. A power of attorney is a legal document that gives someone else the power to act on your behalf. And we have two types in Ontario, a continuing power of attorney for property and a power of attorney for personal care. The power of attorney for personal care is a document where you name someone to become uh, your attorney to make personal care decisions on your behalf if you become incapable, mentally incapable, making those decisions yourself. So the attorney is not a lawyer, it's a person that you trust to make decisions when you're not able to do so yourself. So personal care decisions can refer to decisions about your health care, for example, consenting to treatment could be um, various types of medical treatment from um, prescription medications through to surgery could have to do with decisions about your diet, your housing situation, uh, your admission to long-term care, your clothing, your hygiene, your personal safety. So all of those decisions can be made by your power of attorney for personal care. The other type is the power of attorney for property, which is a legal document that allows you to appoint an attorney to make financial decisions for you. Essentially, your power of attorney 
continuing power of attorney for property allows your attorney to step into your shoes and make any financial decisions that you can make yourself. So again, an attorney is not a lawyer. Um, in this case, it's just a person that you trust to make decisions and manage your property on your behalf. And depending how it's written, it can be either used when you're in mentally incapable or while you're still capable. Um, so it, it can be drafted either way. And an example of why, you know, people might often ask, well, why would you want it to, that your power of attorney for property to be valid while you're still capable? There could be situations, for example, where you have to be out of the country for a number of months for travel or work, and you want someone to be able to look after your property in Canada while you're away, and that could be done through a power of attorney for property. However, if you just want it to be only apply when you're found mentally incapable and you're unable to make your own financial um, decisions and look after your property yourself, you can also draft it to um, be like, be function in that way. Again, you don't necessarily need a lawyer to prepare your power of attorney documents. Um, you can do it through the Steps to Justice also has a guided pathway for uh, power of attorney, powers of attorney documents. Uh, so I encourage anyone who's, who feels that um, they want to try that, uh, to give it a, give it a try. Um, I think it's quite an effective tool, particularly for the power of attorney documents, because they, they tend to be quite straightforward. However, a lawyer can also guide you through that process and make sure that both your will and your powers of attorney are valid and effective. So if you have a situation that's unusual or complicated, that may be a circumstance um, where you might want to hire a lawyer to help you out rather than to do it yourself. So what happens if you don't have a power of attorney for health? Everyone in the province of Ontario has what's, what's called a substitute decision maker who can make decisions for you. And there's a hierarchy of who is the substitute decision maker for each person. So that hierarchy is spelled out in the Healthcare Consent Act and it goes in this order. A guardian of the person who's a court appointed person an attorney under a power of attorney for health care. Next would be a representative appointed by uh, a tribunal called the Consent and Capacity Board, a uh, spouse or a partner, a child or a parent, brother or sister, any other relative, and last, a public guardian and trustee. So this is, this is the list the that goes from top to bottom. So I, I just have them listed. But if you, if you were to do it in a bullet point, you would start at the guardian of the person and the last one would be the PG&T. So essentially, when you're trying to figure out who's your substitute decision maker, you would start at the top of the list and say, do I have a guardian of person who's court appointed? No, okay. Do I have an attorney who's, a public, or who's appointed under my power of attorney? Yes, okay, that's my substitute decision maker. If you don't have a power of attorney, you would go to next, do I have a representative appointed by the Consent and Capacity Board? If not, then it's my spouse or partner. If I don't have a spouse or partner, then it's a child or my parent. If I don't have any children or parents, then it's my brothers and sisters. So you just keep going down until you find someone on that list that applies. Public guardian and trustee is known as the um, substitute decision maker of last resort. So they only get involved if there is nobody else to help out. And if you don't have a power of attorney for property and you're found incapable of managing your property, um, the P Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee becomes your guardian of the property. That's often a temporary arrangement and family members can apply to the public guardian and trustee to essentially replace the public guardian and trustee as your guardian of property or apply to court to be appointed as guardian. So there's a couple of different routes of making that happen if you don't have a power of attorney for property. But obviously that's one of the benefits of doing the document, um, the power of attorney documents is that you can you have the choice to decide who is going to fulfill those roles rather than a court deciding or the public and guardian and trustee or or having someone um, under that um, substitute decision maker list 
be appointed. So, so I've just come up with a list of a few common questions. One thing people often ask is who should be my power of attorney uh, for either the continuing power of attorney for property or personal care? First of all, it needs to be someone that you trust and who's going to carry out your instructions faithfully and fairly. Um, it should be someone who is financially savvy, so they don't have to be an accountant necessarily, but they have to be someone who's reasonably organized and able to contact banks and pay bills and determine what needs to be done um, for your finances, for example. You cannot name someone as your attorney for personal care if they are paid to give you health care, residential, social training or support services, unless that person is also your spouse, partner or relative. So often, often for people who are in a committed relationship, it might be your, your partner, it could be your, your legally married spouse, um, it could be your children. It could be your brothers or sisters, it might be your parents, it could be a close friend. So there's, there's really no specific person it needs to be, it's your choice. And it, it really comes down to who do you trust and who do you think will be good at fulfilling that role. Can you revoke your power of attorney document or your will once you've, you've created them? Yes if you are mentally capable of doing so, you can revoke them um, and have new ones prepared. But sometimes what happens is people prepare them when they're mentally capable and then they later become mentally incapable. At that point, you can no longer change your will or your power of attorney for personal care or your continuing power of attorney for property unless you become capable again at a later point. And again, capacity is, I know what my will is, or I, I know what a continuing power of attorney for property is, or power of attorney for personal care is. I know the property that I own, and I know who would normally expect to benefit from my will, um, or I know what kind of decisions that my power of attorney for personal care would make for me. So it's a very simple test for capacity, really. And... An important thing to know about capacity is that capacity is really dependent on, on time, that there are people can be capable one moment and incapable the next. So it really depends, that, that determination is often made by a, a healthcare professional. Um, but just because you're found incapable at, at a certain point in time, doesn't mean that you're incapable for the rest of your life. You could, that, that, can, that situation can change. Is your handwritten will legal in Ontario? The answer is yes, if it meets certain legal requirements. A handwritten will is the same thing as a holograph will. And if it's completely written in your own handwriting, signed and dated, then it's a valid will in Ontario. It's important that all of it's in your own handwriting. So you can't do a combination of computer, uh, like a document that's typed on the computer and then handwritten notes. It has to be all in your own handwriting to be a, ho a valid holograph will. You don't need any witnesses for a, a holograph will. When does the power of attorney for personal care take effect? It only takes effect once you've been uh, found mentally incapable of making your own personal care decisions. So your power of attorney for personal care cannot make personal care decisions for you until you've been found mentally incapable. So even if you want them to make personal care decisions for you, they can't under the law if you are still capable of making those decisions yourself. And again, one of the important concepts with capacity is capacity is also dependent upon treatment. So you may be capable of making certain kinds of uh, health care decisions for yourself. For example, you may have the capacity to understand the risks involved in taking a medication, um, but it could be, there could be a situation where a more complex decision, say involving major surgery, is, is beyond your cap capacity uh, for, for a variety of reasons. So it could be that you're only, you might be found incapable to make certain kinds of treatment decisions.
So one of the things that happens sometimes we're in relationships and they don't last. What happens when you get divorced? Um, if you have a will. So your will is, remains valid. But if you leave a gift um, to your former spouse through the will, that gift is void. So whether it's a specific bequest or the residue, um, your will be, would be interpreted as if your former spouse had predeceased you. So the will, the gift would not go to them. And if you appointed your former spouse as an executor, that would be void. So someone else would need to be appointed executor. Pre-January 1st, 2022, separation had no effect on a person's will. However, after January 1st, 2022, uh, a new bill in Ontario came into effect, Bill 245, which changes that. And essentially, it treats separated spouses the same as divorced spouses in some circumstances. So it, there is a test for if you've been separated and living separate and apart for a certain amount of time, then it's, it, it, your separated spouse is treated in the same way as a, a divorced spouse. And so what happens if you're single and you get married? Pre-January 2022, if you had a will and subsequently got married, your will became invalid, unless you stated specifically in the will that it, the will is made in contemplation of marriage. After January 1st, 2022, um, Bill 245 changes that um, provision, and a will that you make after this date will not be revoked by marriage. The reason the government decided to do that um, was because of it, it was felt that um, there was a certain number of predatory marriages that took place where um, someone would marry someone um, knowing that their previous will uh, would become invalid and as spouse, new spouse under the wills of intestacy, they would inherit. Um, and they were taking, there were certain people who were taking advantage of that, of that law. So they changed it. What happens if you're in a common law spousal relationship? So one of the important things to know about being a common law spouse is that the dis distribution of a person, of the estate of a person who dies without a will, speaks only about a legal spouse. So there's no provision made for common law spouses. If you're living common law, you have to specifically provide for your common law spouse through a will. If you die without a will, the property that you own may not go to your common law spouse unless they bring a court application. Essentially, a common law spouse is left in a position where they would have to uh, demonstrate um, uh, dependency. So bring a what's called a dependence relief application to the court in order to inherit your property after you die. So if you decide you want to use a lawyer to do your will or your power of attorney for personal care or your continuing power of attorney for property, how, how do you find a lawyer? I always recommend that people talk to their friends or their family members and find out um, if they have someone to recommend if they went to a lawyer for their will. I have looked in the yellow pages, but actually I don't even know if people get yellow pages anymore, so ignore that. Um, there is a law society of, this, uh, this is actually a little out of date, I should say the Law Society of Ontario, it's no longer called the Law Society of Upper Canada, thank goodness. Um, they have a, a number for a referral service and the Waterloo Law Association also has the directory where you can search for a lawyer who practices in the areas of wills and estates. I recommend that route as well. As I mentioned before, um, www.stepstojustice.ca is a great resources for the guided pathways for both wills and power of attorney documents. It's also an excellent resource for all kinds of other information about um, Ontario areas of law. So it's specific to the province of Ontario um, and wills and estates are, uh, are provincial jurisdiction. So um, different provinces have different laws with respect to wills and estates. So you want 
on, uh, you want information that's specific to Ontario. If you move to another province, your um, your will may be valid, but you would want to check in with a lawyer in that in that province because there are some subtle change so subtle differences between provinces. The website for the Ministry of the Attorney General in Ontario also has some information on estate planning and wills. Um, I put down a resource from another legal clinic, um, the Gray Bruce Legal Clinic, that has a sample will on their website. Um, there are also power of attorney kits on the Ministry of the Attorney General website. But I think the Steps to Justice is the, the site that I recommend the most for both the guided pathway for wills and the power of attorney documents. All right, so I'm going to open it up to questions. I'm going to stop my screen share and encourage people to pop up their hand and ask a question. And I see Scott's already got his hand up. I and do. we're going to stop the recording at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you.